अब सभी फैशन में नए मकान बना रहे हैं वैसे पुराने संस्कृति को तो बंद ही कर दिया था क्योंकि पुरानी संस्कृति इतनी किसी को पता नहीं कि मिट्टी के घर कैसे बनती हम जब काम करते हैं पहले पैर शुरू से कच्चे बनते थे ये हो गया दस बीस साल हो गया अब पंद्रह पुटो को पहले हमारे मकान कच्चे है पंजा पंजा सत्रह से अस्सी साल हो गया उन मकानों को बुजुर्गों ने बनाए हैं उसमे लपाई नहीं होगा कुछ नहीं होगा पक्का बना दिया तो बस बिल्डिंग on their property next to the houses that already exist and the brick and mortar buildings and there's no scope of getting an old house and renovating there is you have to look <laughs> like i know in in this village behind the temple there are a few houses called manchli wadi there are a few houses there one of those houses has been taken up by uh, some people who have renovated it and it's being let out to other people right now okay. but they leased a old mud house But all mud houses are found in that village. So we call the we say mud houses, but I think the walls are mostly made of stone, okay. and the lepai is done with mud. Ha, so stone and mud. It's stone. Pehle na they used to use mud bricks. Yahan pe nahi. Yeah. In this side of the mountain, it's mostly all old houses are stone houses with mm-hmm. lepai. Rain. Rain, and I think the material here, as in the the this mountain at least, is much more sandy. 
the soil than clay. If you go further down in weed, it will get clay in places, but bari is uh, sand. So I think it depends a lot on what your local materials are. Like Didi's houses use a lot of bamboo, but local houses have no bamboo because bamboo doesn't grow here. It grows in Andretta, it grows in Sitbari, but not in Bari. Yeah, that's the whole concept of it. Use local materials. कैसे आए पर ये इम्पोर्टेंट है कि आ गए कैसे भी आ गए होंगे आ गए पहुंच गए मुझे वो याद नहीं है बट मैंने कहा आपके जैसे मिट्टी का घर चाहिए ये मुझे बिल्कुल पक्का याद है कि ये घर किस साल में आई You came here in '98. '98, I retired from HP University, and वो घर तैयार था. आ गई है, loved it. जो भी था तो just beautiful. था तो हम लोग इधर आ गए और बच्चे भी बाहर आए, देखे गए, आते जाते रहे. But I stayed on here. 
और तब से तब से मैं हूँ यहाँ पे बहुत खुश हूँ और कहीं और जाने की मर्जी नहीं मगर मेरी टांग टूट गई थी तो आई नीडेड अ व्हील चेयर तो ये फिर एक्स्ट्रा बना hmm. जो अब देखो होगा इधर सो दैट चल सके गाड़ी चल सके <laughs> तो बट दैट पार्ट इज ऑलवेज दैट पार्ट ऑफ मी I don't want to go anywhere else. Hey, Rana, mujhe. Jab bhi the, ye hai ke yahan par cover nahi bana sakte. I believe the government won't allow. <laughs> Kya? Even Didi wanted to be buried here, it seems, but it's not allowed. preparation that i would meet her just for a day and um, and then i would leave but somehow that day extended to to four and a half years of living with her it was in april in 2017 so there was like bright summer light and uh, didi had already given me instructions as to how to find her house and where to come and all of that and uh, yeah i came in and i uh, i entered through the kitchen door into this like long cuboidal space that you see and um, yeah like my i just couldn't stop looking at all the objects that were so neatly arranged um in a particular order that it created a sense of balance and harmony that actually felt like i had arrived so living everyday life with didi um it was quite fascinating for me um because i could literally see her practice everything she preached um you know right from um managing the garbage of the house you know segregating all the waste that would come through in her hand like even if it was like biscuit wrappers cardboard boxes um silver wrappers wet garbage then um metal waste so everything had a purpose you know and everything had a purpose to be recycled
There's a lot of thought that goes in the process of making and in the process of inhabiting. And one of the things that I learned from her was also like how do you imagine a building? So when she's imagining, she's not only she's not imagining a building, but she's actually imagining what the user will experience through the building, how the building relates to the surrounding landscape, how the surrounding landscape can enter the building, how does light enter, how do you feel the wind, how do you um, listen to the sound of the rain. Also, she would say like architecture can be a setting for a certain drama to unfold in the space.
don't see myself as either modern or traditional. I see myself as pragmatic within a moment that arises out of tradition in a moment that is modern. And to me, to me modern has been the analytical process uh, which has led me to discard the contemporary materials of the, the co economy that are foistered on the, I mean, the, the, for, for ecological reasons. And um, uh, so I've used um, what I know of sym symmetry to the, and made sure that a square is a square and not just a little bit off so it disturbs you and try to re relate the different components of the room to the repe repetition of certain um, sizes and certain types of spaces. So I've worked the dynamic symmetry is my driving force and from tradition I've taken I've studied a lot of the places where they've used bamboo and they've used wood in a combination and then I let that ferment and come up. Some of it's rich is um, um, it just is from my own artistic inspiration, but the inspiration that feeds that. So how, how to cycle that is. So this room is, it's um, um, the, 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 huh? See it. So okay, well, it's here, the room is here, it's around you. I feel this terrible overriding anxiety that I don't know why everybody isn't sharing of what's happening to the world. I mean, the, the, the question of climate change is with us. Nothing has changed. The, the figures, the statistics that look like we're leading like lemmings over the cliff. And I think that building being one of the um, activities that both <coughs> creates the ambience in which everything takes place. And so I'm put my heart into trying to create spaces in which this sort of discussion could come forward and to see one coming forward in the field that I've been working in is just wonderful. But then on the other hand, there's this awful anxiety that hangs over us all and which I feel is not being taken sufficiently seriously. And then within that, there's the other anxiety when I drive from uh, Sitbari to here, that what used to be when I came here 40 years ago, a beautiful pastoral setting, and now a city has followed us.
left the confusion and the um, discord of the city looking for a place for peace and also looking for some way to connect with what I felt was in the countryside still was a sort of a, a, the provide, presiding wisdom of tradition which in India was still very strong. I remember in six, in the, that was in 1950 when I first came, India was still such a beautiful country. And then when I first came up here in the early 70s, this was also a beautiful area. Other places have begun to be spoiled. Now that followed us everywhere we go, this sort of, the things that I was happy to leave in America when I came to India in 1951 um, have followed me here. The cheap food, the, the, the sort of junk, the, and the best things of the modern world have not necessarily followed. And I feel that, that as architects, one sort of sets the, in architecture and in landscaping, one sets the general agenda within which things take place, the surrounding or ambience that, that gives rise. My background is that I'm an artist, and I'm the, the daughter of artists. And from my early childhood, aesthetics has been sort of the main thing discussed. And my father was a, a German expressionist painter and knew the people when they scattered into America as refugees. He was in touch with the other friends who had also been part of the formation of the Bauhaus and the Blue Rider and different groups of that time which were attempting <coughs> to define a new aesthetic in the period just before the First World War and the period just after that interwar period which has changed completely by the Second World War. So they, they, sometimes I feel that they concentrated on this new language, new visual language and let, the, let fascism, the horrors of the war take place because their concentration was there. But over the years I've come to realize or to feel myself that that concentration which was on the quality of life, the quality of visual experience, the quality of a person's reaction with the environment and what inspires the soul.
that is mind-boggling concept that is now going out of the Anthropocene. They're, they're the, the geological ages that have defined the geological history of the Earth. And there is now a very strong realization on the parts of the geologists that we are now in a period in which human activity is defining the geological activity our imprint which is negative on the planet which we see here very much because we we have a little fresh snow for you this is not usual that we have the fresh snow it's like we're showing our best side <laughs> otherwise I've seen the main markers of the Doladar was a big field of snow which is now just an edge it's gone now within the last decade a, a glacial t formation on the mountain that defined that mountain is gone and so this idea that we have as human beings endangering the earth and created an entirely different planetary situation. And in this, um, there's the, I have a concept that maybe we're borrowing from nature to build, that we have to, to make a new relationship between nature and human beings, which you can to some extent demonstrate in different ways of building.
she designed in a, in a, in a, these houses, as I say, along with the people. It wasn't sort of just dreaming it up by herself. But then she would have these ideas in the night or a very early morning where she would suddenly get a vision of how that window would look with the view that it has and so on. And you, you, you know, your house is built with an idea of what it's like to look out and then what it's like to look in from outside and how it feels to the person who comes. So the design of this building was a little tricky, I think, apart from the fact that it was one of her first buildings. And the fact that it's built on these levels means that it had to have a stone base. So she was always keen on building in mud, but she hadn't had a lot of experience building in mud. But the top floor of this is all in mud and it's really successful. And, and I know she put a huge amount of effort into learning how to deal with the beams and the bamboos and everything. So by the time she got to my house, she was much more skilled at how this all worked. Um, but the stone uh, kind of suits the hospital atmosphere quite well and um, the fact that it comes up onto different levels. I think all the staff here are happy working here. I think this is one of the things that I tells the building are people happy with it. Yeah, so in the later years, she, she was working on all these things, and then, um, you know, she had increasing poor health, which was unfortunate, but she never stopped um, dreaming about that next building, or this idea that she had, that she had to enact, and so on. And, um, I mean, I really, really respect everything she did, and what she did, tried to do for India, though that seems to have they did quite a lot. There are very few people who really, who are really uh, wedded to the idea of living in a mud house. So maybe I should just say I live in a mud house, and I have never, never dreamt of being happier in my whole life. I would never move to a concrete house, not if you, you know, took me bound and kicking, because a mud house has a feeling to it which is. Um, I mean, it's unbelievable. It, it's a house that is a part of you, that you become a part of. We don't get sick in our house. We don't get viral fevers. We don't feel unwell. Um, you know, we, we, have so, we have lots of nice ventilation. We don't need fans. When people talk about Didi, one of the things you hear the most is, oh, she works with mud. But it was, and that's true, of course, but she worked with earth. And not just earth as a material, but earth as a living system. And so already that requires such a deep and vast sensitivity to all of the micro and macro levels of the earth is a system. So the earth is a living organism, the human as a living organism, the family or a group of people that are occupying a space as a living system in relationship with a larger living system. So what kind of sensitivity is required to design a space for a complex system rather than a kind of one-dimensional user? It's an extraordinary emotional sensitivity. It's a sensitivity to, of course, the obvious things like material and light, space and form. But also a sensitivity to process, what's going to be happening in a space. So to take this room, for example, um, Didi understood that we'd be doing yoga here, we'd be doing meditation here. But the main function that the space is meant to catalyze is the opening of hearts, the awakening of, of people to 
the realities of the current world and the possibilities of the world that could be. So how do you design for that? That's a complex brief. It's a multi-dimensional brief. Her approach to design was very much a living process. And it starts with a dream, a beautiful vision that would have been good enough. But then as the space begins to come up and we begin to use the space while it's being built, and you see where people are moving, where they're drawn to stop and rest, it tells you something about the way humans are experiencing and understanding the space and naturally, organically drawn to use it. And I would notice these things. And every now and then would call Dee Dee and say, I'm noticing people are tending to congregate here, you know, in a place we didn't expect. We thought that would be a circulation space that people just pass through, but they're actually using it. What do you think? And she would think for a few seconds. She say, aha, I see a new, new design, I'll send it to you tomorrow. And she would make uh, an adjustment, a revision to the design to, to enhance what the people using the space were, were naturally discovering. And her openness uh, and flexibility in that way was also very moving to me. It made it very fun to work with her as well because we're, we're, we're playing and creating the whole time. Oh my you were taking that for us. Yeah. Oh, you're not calling, so I'm not playing. 100% right. Yeah. It's so true. I think that 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 flavor was what I was missing in the dal that I made this. I think it could have been sweet. Last night my friend and I were talking about uh, like berries and coconut yogurt. Oh, okay. Talking? Just talking. <laughs> what happened to the market dips? Yeah, it's out there. One of the many strongly held values um, that all of the materials that come from our world deserve the same kind of respect that the earth herself deserves. And that is the same whether we're talking about mud or stone or bamboo or wood. We talk a lot about 
ecologically sensitive design, eco-friendly architecture. But one of the first things that I often tell my students when they come for a new program is quoting Didi. She said, when we talk about eco-friendly buildings, the most eco-friendly building is no building. But then once we've decided that a new building is needed, then how can we stack functions in this space? How can we use space in creative and flexible ways to minimize the footprint of the building, thereby minimizing the materials that will be required? And then once we've done that, what are the materials that, that we're going to use? Well, first of all, obviously, as much from on-site as possible. The less we bring in from outside, the lower the carbon footprint will be uh, of transporting the materials. Um, Didi was not an extremist who would you know, never use a speck of concrete or, or a piece of rebar. But each use of market materials had to be carefully justified. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to mark six inches? That's the wall and yarn. Extension. Extension. Right. We have already drawn the extension for the foundation, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're thinking, or what was discussed with Mark Dempsey, was we could dig one foot behind where the wall is now. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. One foot behind where the wall is now. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing one, so I have my 12 inch like current existing wall. So our initial plan was to do 12 inches, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then six inch out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Architectural design was her yoga practice, which was very personal for her. She didn't talk about it uh, too much in public, but it was the center of her spiritual practice. It was that art of looking into a need, understanding the humans that are involved, feeling the energy of the place itself, and feeling her way into the alchemy of the needs of the humans with the energy of the place and how could a built structure catalyze a harmonious relationship between the two. So it's that approach of Didi's to a, a deep and contemplative design process that we now share with students from around India and around the world. This is south, right? So the second story is coming here behind. Right. So we're doing that for the entirety of the north wall or just these three columns to the north? Exactly. Just, just these, these it's not really needed elsewhere, so why would mm, we waste that yeah. material? And then we actually don't need to do it on the south at all. We right. just need on these on these columns over there. Right? You got it. So 215, mm -hmm. we'll meet upstairs review the drawings, then come back out. दीदी से यही सीखा कि क्योंकि जो जहाँ की मिट्टी वहीं का मटेरियल वहीं ज़्यादा यूज़ उसको करो आप बाहर से कम मगाओ और जैसे टाइल लगाने से फिर स्लेट के फर्श लगाना ज़रूरी है क्योंकि टाइल का फर्श लगाना बहुत ही टफ होता है क्योंकि उसके लिए इतनी मुश्किल हो जाती है कई बार गिर जाते तो पानी होगा तो स्लेट के ऊपर पानी होगा तो उसमें गिरते नहीं आदमी कोई भी
अगर यही है हमारे को कि भाई डीडे का काम हम पीछे निकलेंगे आगे बढ़ता जाए इतना चाहे क्योंकि तो इसी काम से हमारे को यही है कि क्योंकि तो कंक्रीट का घर बनाना तो उसमें हमारे को बाद में तोड़ना होगा तो उसको ये तो ट्रक चाहिए लोडिंग करने के लिए और कचरा फेंकने के लिए कहीं दूर ले जाना चाहिए तो मिट्टी सौ साल के बाद भी तोड़ेंगे तो मिट्टी मिट्टी में काम आ जाएगी और उसमें क्या होगा जी भाई खे, खेती भी कर सकते और कंक्रीट के घर में खेती नहीं हो सकती बाद में तोड़ने के बाद भी खेती नहीं हो सकती Thank you.